Well, good morning, Erie Side. Good morning. good morning. It's so great to be with you this morning. So so glad to uh, be here and worshiping the Lord with you. Uh, and uh, if you're joining us for the first time today, whether in person or online, we're so thankful. Thank you for visiting with us this morning. And if you are online, uh, we just wanted to let you know we made some upgrades to our equipment this week. Uh, so it, that's hopefully to give us a better experience if you're, if you're at home watching with us and worshiping with us. Uh, so please, we appreciate your patience as we kind of adjust to the new settings and the new setup. Uh, but we're so thankful to have that opportunity to, to worship together uh, in person here and online. And so we do ask that in accordance with the governor's mandate, everyone in here in person would wear their mask during our service this morning. And if this is your first Sunday with us uh, we, and you'd like to get to know more about Erie Side Church, you can see up on the screen some ways that you can get a hold of us. Uh, if you are here in person, you can also ask an usher on the way out uh, for more information about our church. Uh, but there's some ways to get a hold of us. And also, I have three announcements again for us this week, and they'll be quick today, hopefully. Men's breakfast. Thanks to everyone who joined us yesterday, uh, all the men who were able to join us for the morning. It was a great time of fellowship and a great time of food. So thanks in particular to Jim Grief for all the delicious food, uh, Bryant Bonanno for sharing with us yesterday, Pastor Jason for leading us in worship, and to Jim Wilcox for organizing the whole morning for us. It was a, a blessing. Amen, gents? It was great. Yeah, thank you. And if you weren't able to join us, there is a very providential reason why they're called quarterly breakfasts. And that's because they usually happen about once a quarter, unless a snow day or a pandemic shuts us down, you know. Um, so we, you can plan on joining us men. Uh, it can be young men, old men, any, anywhere in between men. Uh, join us for, for this breakfast, uh, and we will let you know when we get closer to the, the winter date, uh, winter quarter, what the date will be for that. But we would love to have all our men here gathered together and... and in fellowship and around some good food, too. Uh, and so also wanted to remind us of our, um, one last time, because it's this Tuesday, about our upcoming annual meeting. Again, Tuesday, 7 p.m. here in the CLC. This has been one of the most unique ministry years, uh, so you'll hear one of the most unique annual reports this, from this year. But we'd love to have you join us for that, uh, for that meeting together. So mark your calendars. And lastly, I wanted to make sure to remind everyone of our Halloween outreach opportunity here at Erie Side. Again, these are for you to pass out to specific neighbors that you know. Not just to pass out on your front porch, but those specific neighbors or family members that you know might be interested in who Jesus is, or maybe the, they're on the fence about this whole Christianity thing. Uh, these are to help you build a gospel relationship in your sphere of influence. And I have a sample bag here for you all this morning. Um, so these are going to be, we're actually going to have some bigger bags so that we can fit more candy and more info in there. Um, but this is kind of what you're going to get. You're going to get a bag with candy. And then also, it'll have some information. You can see some information about our church brochures, uh, devotional, and then also an introduction to the gospel for kids. So we'll have a gospel tract in there. And then also for their parents as well, this book called Who is Jesus? Uh, so this is going to be a good way to build bridges with those who you know uh, who might be interested in learning about who Jesus is. Um, this is a great opportunity for us. And so there's two important things that I want to remind everyone here about uh, in ways that we need your help in this. First, let us know how many bags you'll want to pass out uh, by signing up this week on our website. Uh, I think there are people who are planning on handing out bags who we have not heard from yet, but it's crucial that we know how many, how many bags we need so that we prepare the right amount for you. So I would just say also, if you don't use the internet, you can call yes. the office and let us know. Yes, you for can. For the handful of you that, that choose not to use the internet, who are <laughs> yes. obviously wiser than the rest of us. But, yes, uh, you can. <laughs> yeah. You can for sure. Leave us a message. We, we just want to know how many bags we should prepare for you. We would love to provide those for you to build those gospel relationships. And so please let us know this week how many you need so that we know how many, uh, how many bags we should prepare. And also... The second thing that we need is candy. Uh, we are we want to show the generosity of Christianity by blessing these families and the children in particular with a bunch of candy in their bags. So 
Uh, we are going to be collecting candy this week and next week uh, in order to fill up each of these outreach bags with plenty of candy. So if you'd like to drop off some candy, hopefully you saw the, the bin in the back in the CLC lobby. We greatly appreciate your uh, help in blessing our neighbors and our community. So we're going to be collecting that through October 20th. And one last detail, if you sign up for bags, uh, we will have them ready for you on Sunday, October 25th to pick up. So if you, so that you know when to expect them, we'll be giving them out Sunday, October 25th for you to then pass out on Halloween or that week uh, to those that you know. And so lastly, before we, we sing together this morning, uh, our weekly game plan reminder. And before I give that, uh, I, we have a, a car announcement. Um, if you have a Honda V or you, I'm not sure. Um, if you have a car, a Honda van, okay, sorry, a Honda van uh, with the, with the pl license plate HTU 2939, uh, your door is open. We would love for you to not uh, have to charge your battery after service. So if you want to go check that out and to uh, shut your door, um, we just want to let you know that. So uh, on to our, our, our game plan this morning. You know, as a, I was just going to say, as a as a parent, I can think of a number of reasons why I might have left my van door open. <laughs> Are right? most of them not related to you? I was trying not to embarrass the one person that had to get up and leave. I'm just thinking, have you ever gotten in the van and there's, a, there's an odor? And you're like, what is that? And now I have to leave the van door open. So mm -hmm. maybe she was doing it on purpose. That's right. Yes. Well, there you go. <laughs> so... We just wanted to, uh, to go through our game plan again this morning. First, be sure to play, pay close attention to our online communications, email, Facebook, our website for, for updates on events that are happening this week. Uh, again, so excited to, to have more ministry going on here, but we want to make sure that you're in the loop so you know when to show up. And also, here's some ways to stay in contact with us, with our Erie Side Church leadership uh, on the screens, and you can see ways to, to stay in touch with us. Uh, also, a reminder that uh, the offering box is outside the CLC entrance right now. If you'd like to drop off your tithes and offerings or your uh, voting ballot, if you're a voting member here for our annual meeting. Uh, lastly, a reminder, we're still doing fellowship outside, so please wait to greet one another until you've made it outside after service. The restrooms are open, uh, and also is the CLC lobby. If your allergies act up, if you need to sneeze or cough, there's sanitizer out there for you. And so now, will you join me in prayer as we enter worship this morning? Lord, we are so thankful to be gathered together this morning, thankful for the privilege of worshiping you. You are worthy, and we are so glad to be able to praise your name for who you are, for all that you've done. God, unite our hearts, unite our spirits together to praise you. And God, let everything else fade away so that we can focus more, more closely and more deeply on you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We want to invite you to stand with us today. We're going to sing Come Thou Fount. Come Thou Fount of every place my heart to sing thy grace streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above praise the mount i fixed upon it mount of thy I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the To grace, I'll bring. 
assurance I found in you, I found in you. I won't be shaken, I will not be moved. How steadfast your strong hand is keeping me, is keeping me. I won't be shaken. Blessed assurance. Amen, church. I want to. This last song we want to do is called Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. And I was telling the men yesterday, uh, it's based on a passage in 2 Corinthians where Paul talks about one day we will be able to see the Lord with unveiled face. He talks about the ways that, the, uh, that his face has been veiled from us because, of course, he's just too holy, right? Um, we, you might think of... Um, of, of Moses when he would go to be with the Lord. They said his, he would come out and he'd have to wear a veil because his face shone with his glory. And so uh, we want to sing this song about one day we will stand in all the glory of the Lord and we'll get to see him and praise him with nothing in between us, not these frail shells. We'll have glorified bodies and fully uh, understand who he is and what a blessing that will be. So let's sing Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. Come behold the wondrous mystery In the dawning of the King Be the theme of heaven's praises Robed in frail humanity In our longing, in our darkness Now the light of life has come to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom us. Come behold the wondrous mystery, be the
Christ in power resurrected as we will be when he comes. Amen. You guys may be seated. This morning, as we enter our time in the Word, I wanted to offer a prayer together on the topic of worship from the Valley of Vision. Will you join me in prayer this morning? It is the flame of my life to worship Thee, the crown and glory of my soul to adore Thee, heavenly pleasure to approach Thee. Give me power by the Spirit to help me worship now, that I may forget the world be brought into fullness of life, be refreshed, comforted, blessed. Give me knowledge of thy goodness that I might not be overawed by thy greatness. Give me Jesus, Son of Man, Son of God, that I might not be terrified but be drawn near with filial love, with holy boldness. He is my mediator, brother, interpreter, branch, daysman, lamb, him I glorify, in him I am set on high. Crowns to give I have none, but what thou hast given I return, content to feel that everything is mine when it is thine, and the more fully mine when I have yielded it to thee. Let me live holy to my Savior, free from distractions, from carking care, from hindrance to the pursuit of the narrow way. I am pardoned through, Je through the blood of Jesus. Give me a new sense of it, Continue to pardon me by it. May I come every day to the fountain and every day be washed in thee. Let me worship thee always. Amen. Well, go ahead and turn with me in your Bibles to the book of James, chapter 3. Uh, let me say again welcome to Erie Side Church. We are so glad you've joined us today whether uh, online or uh, in person, and if you are watching online, uh, as Gary mentioned, we have some new uh, equipment, and so um, I hope you'll give us some grace as we work through, you know, a handful of inevitable bugs, but we really wanted to make sure that your uh, worship experience um, was, was better, and so we, we just asked for a little bit of grace there. Speaking of grace... It has been brought to my attention that as we've been working through the book of James, it's possible some folks might get the impression that James is giving us a list of ways to be obedient so that, or in order that, we might become a Christian. All right? Um, it, 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 it's come to my attention that it's possible to, uh, to listen to James and think what he's saying is, here's how you earn your salvation. Uh, Bryant Bonanno spoke to our men at Men's Breakfast yesterday, and he talked about growing up thinking there were boxes you had to check in order to be a Christian. And so we know that's not the case. I'm aware, if we're not careful, James will come across that way. I would hope that the years of preaching I've already done here at Erie Side would be enough of a reminder that that isn't the case, but just in case it isn't, or if you're new here at Erie Side, let me be clear, we are not saved by our works, and James isn't saying we're saved by our works. As I said a few weeks ago, comparing Paul and James, Paul writes to unbelievers telling them how to get saved, we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, totally apart from our works. And James is writing to believers, telling them what is the evidence of their already having been saved. So when we read James talking about the necessity of works, he isn't telling us how to become saved. He's telling us what will necessarily happen once we are saved. And if that evidence James is talking about is missing in your life, so if, we, if, you're, if you're lacking that Godly wisdom, steadfastness under trial, loving your neighbor, living free from partiality, etc. If that evidence is lacking in your life and you claim to be a believer, then that's where you're going to need to do some serious heart searching. If that evidence is missing from your life and it doesn't convict you in your heart, then that's a problem and you need to seek the Lord in prayer. 
This isn't about checking a box or making a list to get faith. It's about the result of having faith implanted. And so I hope that clears a few things up today. I mentioned last week one of my grave concerns regarding the church as a whole, not just Erie side, but uh, the church everywhere, is our inability to distinguish truth from error. I suppose there are any number of ways we might describe this problem. We could say we lack discernment. We could talk about the fact we're being deceived. We're not familiar enough with the truth to recognize it when we see it. However you might want to uh, label it, one truth remains clear. We need wisdom. And so James writes to offer us that wisdom and to tell us how to recognize that wisdom when we see it. He's introduced, he introduced this topic in the first chapter already. And so for this reason, I've entitled our message today, Faith and Wisdom Part 2. So we've already had Faith and Wisdom Part 1 once before. And so in this passage, James asks a question that may very well be on your mind already. At least, I would hope it is. He's been talking about wisdom and how it pertains to faith throughout the entirety of the letter. He's told us if we ask for wisdom, God will grant it so long as we ask in faith in chapter 1 verse 5. He told us that a lack of wisdom and faith creates a kind of double-mindedness where we try to straddle two worlds, the flesh and the spirit in chapter 1 verse 8. He's told us that our wisdom stems from having the word implanted in us in chapter 1 verse 19. Thus we will know God in his will. And he's told us that true wisdom means obedience. Obeying that implanted word in faith, which will then produce righteousness in our lives in chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. So then, the logical question should be, how can I know if I have wisdom? He's made it clear that having wisdom is going to be essential to the Christian life. So then, how can I know if I have wisdom? How can I know if what I think is wisdom is really godly wisdom? How can I know if I'm wise? And so James writes to answer that question for us today. Would you look with me in your Bibles to James chapter 3? And we'll uh, we'll begin reading verse 13. James chapter 3, verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. That is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Would you bow your heads with me this morning. Lord, we thank you for this day, and we are so, uh, as always, are just so thankful for your word. We recognize this morning how desperately we need the truth of your word, the wisdom of your word. Lord, we recognize how desperately we need to be word-shaped people. We know how we would stand out from the world if that were the case. That the, wis- that, that the wisdom of the word would look so different than the wisdom of the world, it would produce natural opportunities for us to share the gospel. And so, God, I want to ask right now, you would continue to form me by your word. That you would continue to form this church by your word. I pray that you would grant us wisdom. You've told us that if we ask for wisdom in faith, you will give it to us. And so here we are today begging you, God, for more wisdom. In your name, amen. I think I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. I had the opportunity to speak in chapel at my daughter's Christian school. And uh, that was fun. It was exciting. I enjoyed it. Um, Stella blushed on the front row when I mentioned I was her dad. And I look forward to when she's older and I can embarrass her even more. Remind her that I have baby pictures and whatnot. Uh, One of the things I talked with these students about, though, was wisdom. I admitted, and I think you guys would are are probably in the same boat. Um, I admitted that when I was their age, I was under the impression once you became an adult that you would have it all figured out. 
right? Did you feel, I felt like that as like a, as a, an elementary school student, as a teenager, maybe in a, even as a college student. Like once I got to be an adult, man, I'd have all this figured out. I don't know that I ever sensed any uncertainty in my parents and the decisions that they made. And I assumed that when I got to be an adult, I would have all the answers. How many of you adults know that isn't actually the case, right? I, 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 it's not. The truth is most of being an adult so far has consisted of making the best possible decision at the time and then hoping and praying it turned out right. Frankly, black and white decisions in life are few and far between, and most of us end up living in the gray areas where we're honestly not sure which is the right decision, which uh, decision is wise. The older I get, the more confident I become in some decisions, and the less confident I become in others. Please, church, tell me I'm not alone in this, right? Okay, so then what we desperately need is wisdom. We need confident assurance we're making right decisions and doing the right thing. But as we'll see today, there is a significant difference between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of the word. There is a difference between what the lost world says is wisdom and what is right and what the Word of God says is wisdom and is right. And so James writes today to help us distinguish between the two. If I'm going to live my life in a way that honors Christ, if the grace He's given me in salvation is ever going to flesh itself out in obedient action, if I'm going to be that first fruits offering that he talked about that, that point people to Jesus and James says is what we were intended to be and the reason we were saved in the first place, then we're going to need wisdom to do it. And so the first thing James shows us is a question to contemplate. There's a question to contemplate. You can look at verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. That's verse 13. There's a question to contemplate. I hope at this point in the book of James, you've begun asking this question. You've been thinking about what James is thinking about. So he's been talking about wisdom throughout the book. He's told us if we ask for wisdom, it will be granted to us. He's described those with true faith as those who possess wisdom. And he's described wisdom as living obediently to the word of God. So we should ask, how can I know if I am one of those wise men that he's described? How can I know I have wisdom? I want you to consider first the humility required to ask a question like that. Think about the humility that's required. Frankly, most of us are convinced we're right. Most of us are not terribly introspective, and most of us, uh, most of us having arrived at a particular opinion, never again revisit that opinion and retest its validity. So asking a question like, am I, am I really wise, requires admitting we may not be. It requires admitting at least the possibility that you might be wrong. To ask a question like, am I wise, we have to at least be willing to admit we might have come to the wrong conclusions and as a result are living outside of God's will. Frankly, it requires a level of humility not many of us, myself included, have attained. I read in an email recently where someone said, I've thought about this a lot, and if I was wrong, I would have come to the same conclusion you have. Just the other day, I suggested to someone that perhaps they should look at a particular issue from another point of view. They exercise some of that empathy we've been talking about. They may discover a different perspective. And to which they said, I've already made the decision. I know I'm right. I don't have to listen to anyone else. If we're going to be obedient to the text of James, we're going to have to be willing to admit the possibility that what we think is wisdom, these opinions we think are right, these lifestyle choices we believe are honoring to God, may actually be wrong. We might have come to the wrong conclusion about what God requires, and we need to be willing to expose our lives to the light of God's word in order to find the truth. Why else would James write to tell us we can ask for wisdom if he didn't think there were going to be times where we would be lacking wisdom? Why else would James warn us time and again about being deceived 
if we weren't in danger of being deceived, either externally by the world or worse, internally by our own sinful hearts. Because truth be told, most of us never ask the question, am I wise? Most of us assume we are. Most of us assume our way of thinking is the right way of thinking and we, that we're totally in line with God's will. Most of us never bother to ask whether or not our wisdom matches up with God's wisdom. James says, if you think you're wise, go ahead and step forward. Let's analyze your claim. Notice, too, how James frames the question. We might be tempted to say, if you think you're wise... Take this theology test and see if you pass it. If you think you're wise, tell me the particulars of this doctrine or that one. Or if you think you're wise, let me see how emotional and passionate you are in worship. But that's not what James says. James says the way we display our wisdom is by letting our conduct speak for itself. Who's wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. So then, James defines wisdom as the skill of living righteously. James defines wisdom as the skill of living righteously. In the same way that he defines faith as doctrine put into practice, so too does he describe wisdom as the ability to live according to the will of God. So then he analyzes our claim to be wise, not in theological terms, but in practical ones instead. Is our belief put into practice? That is true wisdom. And so, once again, we see this theme of faith that functions, that he's been dealing with the entire series, right? The entire book. So, possessing wisdom is a requirement for the believer in Christ because it's so inextricably linked to faith. Faith is belief in action, right? Wisdom is knowledge put into practice. Both faith and wisdom require us to act on those things we know and believe in our heart. Now, please don't hear me saying that what we know or what we believe is unimportant, right? If I, if I say it is, it is essential that your faith is fleshed out in practice, someone will inevitably hear, all that really matters is what I do, not what I believe. I never said that. James never says that. In fact, what we believe is essential because it's what we believe that's then acted upon in obedience. If I get the belief part wrong, I'll get the obedience part wrong as well. I cannot be accidentally obedient. So our doctrine really does matter. What we believe is essential to our faith, but if that faith never actually, is never actually put into practice, we can't say we believe it in any meaningful way. Does that make sense? So yes, my belief is essential, absolutely. But it's also essential I put it into practice. And if I've yet to put it into practice, then how can I honestly say I believe it? All that to say it's important for us to acknowledge that the Lord defines wisdom differently than we do. In Scripture, wisdom is using our faith in a way that honors Christ. It is faith put into practice. In fact, that phrase, let him show his works, do you see that? In the Greek, it's in the imperative sense. That means James is commanding us to exhibit our wisdom in the way we live, which is fine because that's the only, other way, the, the only way we can exhibit it in the first place. There's no other way to do it. And when he describes our wise living as good works, what that word good works means is a lifestyle that pleases God and causes unbelievers to see Jesus. Then it's clear how the Lord defines wisdom. It begins with the fear of the Lord, Proverbs 1, 7. It enables us to discern right and wrong, Proverbs 2, 9. And it leads us to walk in a manner worthy of God, Proverbs 2, 20. In the New Testament, we discover that wisdom is personified in the person of Jesus Christ, after whom we, believers, are to pattern our lives and hearts. Paul reminds the church in Colossians 2 that in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. To the Romans, Paul wrote, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. Romans eleven thirty three. The true test of wisdom, then, is how closely your life resembles Christ. 
Notice how he defines a lifestyle of wisdom. What does wise living look like? He says wisdom is put into action. It's a wise lifestyle. So what's that lifestyle look like? We are, to, we are to conduct ourselves with meekness. Do you see that word? Some of your translations may have humility or even gentleness. That's fine. Rarely has there been a word so terribly difficult to translate from Greek to English. Nearly every other word we might use, um, meek, humble, gentle, in English carry along this idea, some negative connotation, right? Nearly all those words give the impression of being frightened or weak or somehow incapable, but that's not how the Greek, what the Greek term means at all. It actually means, meekness means power under control. And it was originally used to describe wild horses who had been tamed. So these horses had lost none of their strength or ferocity or ability. They'd simply been brought under control of their master and as a result are now useful for all the hard work that needed to be done. You see, until they were brought under control, they're essentially useless regardless of how much power they have or how much potential they possess. A horse running wild is no help to me until I can bring it under control. Now that I've brought it under control, it's useful. That's what this word means, meek. The person who is meek in a biblical sense is not weak or powerless. Rather, the entirety of their strength is now fully available to be used for God's glory. They can be a first fruits offering because they're controlled by God. Meekness means to live willingly under the sovereign control of God for the purpose of accomplishing His will. We might think of Moses, who I hope none of you, certainly none of you to his face, would consider weak or wimpy when he stood before Pharaoh and demanded he let Israel go. Moses, who was over 80 years old when he led the children of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. Moses, who time and time again literally stood between God's wrath and God's people and begged God to spare them. Moses, who himself said he spoke, uh, who God said rather, he spoke face to face as one man speaks to another. And yet he's described in Numbers 12, 3 as very meek, more than all people who are on the face of the earth. More importantly, we ought to think of Jesus when we think of meekness. Jesus who called us to take his yoke upon us, that is his way of teaching, because he's gentle and humble, that's the same word meek, meaning we should be as gentle and humble as he is. We ought to think of Jesus who said one of the characteristics of men and women in the kingdom was their gentleness, their meekness. We ought to think of, uh, that's Matthew 5.5, 5. we ought to think of Jesus who was so gentle that he said, suffer the little children to come unto me. We ought to think of Jesus who is meek and gentle enough to be called a friend of sinners. And yet Jesus who went to the cross for us. This is what true wisdom looks like. This is who we should model our own Christian wisdom after. Jesus Christ himself. And, and the way we model our wisdom, uh, our own wisdom after the wisdom of Jesus, is with a proper understanding of the gospel. So how, do I live, how, do, how am I supposed to be meek and gentle? By understanding the gospel. This is why every title in this series has included the word and. We must have faith and practice. We must have knowledge and wisdom. Our theology matters here. In fact, it's essential because it's our theological understanding of our salvation that leads us to rightly flesh out this gentle, meek wisdom in practice. We are saved by grace through faith. This world doesn't like to, to talk much about sin. They tend to label it with less offensive terms like mistakes or hurt, brokenness, and pain. All these things are true of sin. They're certainly results of sin. But the truth is we were rebellious, idolatrous, traitorous, and wicked. We rebelled against God. John said we hated the light and chose the darkness. And until Christ chose us to be in fellowship with him, we were lost and utterly hopeless. Moreover, we didn't deserve to be chosen by him. We'd done nothing, nothing to merit that, that choosing, and we weren't going to do anything to merit that choosing. If we happen to be holy now, if we happen to be meek and gentle now, 
If we happen to be wise and make wise choices now, if we happen to live for God's glory now, it is purely by the grace of God. Therefore, we have nothing to brag about. This is why we can be gentle, humble, and meek. In fact, it's why we must be. If our salvation does nothing else for us regarding the way we live, it should at least cause us to be kinder, gentler, and more gracious to those others around us because it was the kindness of gentleness, meekness, and grace of God that saved us. This is wisdom. So James asked this question, am I wise? This is the question to contemplate. And the way we answer it is by comparing our own life and temperament to the life and the temperament of Jesus. Put another way, how we apply the gospel to our lives and then how we flesh out the gospel in our day-to-day living will give us the answer as to whether or not we're wise. Okay, so, but I I want you to notice he gives us a test to determine whether or not our lives and temperaments look like Jesus. I want to have true wisdom, that is the wisdom of Christ. Then I've got to consider the difference between true wisdom and false wisdom. This leads us to, secondly, a category to consider. A category to consider. Look at verse 14. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and insincere. It's a category to consider. We really should say a cat- uh, that there are categories, plural, to consider. There's two. There is not wisdom or false wisdom. And then there's godly wisdom or or, or true wisdom. And we've got to determine which of these categories, our wisdom, by which he means not only what we believe but then how we behave, falls into. Does that make sense? And the way we do this then, he says, is by examining the fruit of your life. Notice first he describes false wisdom. He says, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, then you must not boast and be false to the truth. That word bitter jealousy is sometimes translated envy. It means a self-oriented desire to possess things that are not really yours. We see it used in Acts 5 to describe the Sadducees and high priests who opposed the apostles because they had grown jealous and envious of the power the apostles displayed in their miraculous work, as well as the praise and adulation of the people who had begun following them. Paul condemns this kind of jealousy in Romans chapter 13. Obviously, we see a, a jealousy on a regular basis when people desire what they do not have. James will talk about this later. When they want what is not rightfully theirs, And because James adds the descriptive word bitter, we see it when people are harsh, sharp, and unconcerned with the feelings or concerns of others. We see the false wisdom of jealousy when people challenge our ideas and gain some hearing for that challenge and it bothers us. Why do they listen to that person? This is the kind of jealousy that's grasping and clawing At the first sign, you might lose power, influence, or popularity, whether that would be at at your home, at work, in politics, or even just in culture at large. It's easy to point out this kind of foolishness. It is not wisdom, so it has to be foolishness. It's easy to point out this foolishness in the world, talking about spoiled, rich movie stars or arrogant athletes. We've all seen them. But I don't need to preach to people that aren't here. It's more helpful to bring it closer to home. One of the places we see this kind of foolishness amongst our own is in the Christian culture warrior. These are people who are afraid of Christianity's waning influence in the various institutions of our day and therefore constantly fighting for more influence as if Christ needed our media or our schools or even our government to accomplish his work. Frankly, a God who needed saving by some reporter teacher or governing official would be no God at all. To think he and his influence need saving is the height of foolishness. This false wisdom is characterized by bitter jealousy. It's the constant fear that power and influence are slipping away. 
Notice second, it's characterized by selfish ambition. This is the translation of a Greek word connoting strife, contentiousness, and extreme selfishness. Not surprisingly, um, Aristotle would come to use this word to describe selfish, the selfish ambition of politicians who, Aristotle says, express narrow, partisan zeal, greed, and factionalism. That sounds familiar. It refers to personal gratification and self-fulfillment at any cost. And it refers to the kind of arrogant mindset that's only ever concerned with one's own selfish interests. It has been my near universal experience. These kind of folks are obsessed with their own rights, but rarely talk about their responsibilities. They tout their freedom, but never their duty. They demand autonomy, but refuse to sacrifice. I read a study of evangelicals this week asking, um, who do you hope, so we're in a a political season, right? The study was of evangelicals that says, who do you hope your presidential vote benefits the most? Well, that's a good question. Because as people of the word, you'd like to think, James says we should be, shaped by the word of God. The Word of God here in James has made it abundantly clear that our primary interest should be caring for those who are most vulnerable, those who are most in need, those who are most disenfranchised. He's talked about it four times in three chapters. Surely those claiming the name of Christ will be hoping their vote blesses those other people who are most in need, and yet a full 69% of evangelicals said they hope their vote helped themselves and their family, people like them, and people in their own region or community. Only 15% said they hoped their vote would help those this country has failed. Only 15% of confessing evangelicals thought they should look outside of themselves and outside their own personal interest when it comes to their politics. Now, I happen to think that's un-American, seeing as we fought an entire revolution so that those who'd been disenfranchised by our English oppressors would be given a voice. But more importantly, it's unwise, according to James, because it's selfish. A me-first mentality, or a people-like-me-first mentality, is the epitome of unwise and, most importantly, unbiblical, because it is the most unchrist-like. Christ gave himself as a ransom for many, and we are called to be like him. John MacArthur put it so well. He said, Those whose lives are based on and motivated by human, ungodly wisdom are inevitably self-centered, living in a world in which their own personal ideas, desires, and standards are the measure of everything. Whatever and whoever serves those ends is considered good and friendly. Whatever and whoever threatens those ends is considered bad and an enemy. Those who are engulfed in self-serving wisdom, worldly wisdom resent anyone or anything that comes between them and their own objectives. And the worst part of all this, James says, is that when we go around flaunting this kind of false wisdom, claiming it's true wisdom, boasting about how wise we are, we are lying about what true wisdom is and what it does. We are failing in our most basic duty, which is to point people to Jesus because we're giving them a false impression of who Jesus is and what he's like and what he's come to accomplish. Because true wisdom emanates from Christ, true wisdom must always be accompanied by the humility of Christ. James is being clear. If you claim to be wise and you claim to be like Christ, and yet Bitter jealousy or selfish ambition characterize your heart. He says you're living a lie. You're claiming to be wise, but conducting yourself in a manner that denies that claim. Because, the reason being, bitter jealousy and selfish ambition are the opposite of what Christ looks like. They are contrary to the humility and meekness we just described as characterizing his life. So then those of us who claim to be children of Christ cannot simultaneously be unlike Christ. He continues to describe this not wisdom as earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. So-called wisdom that's earthly is that wisdom that's limited to the present world, its time, and trappings. Earthly wisdom is not heavenly-minded. It's not eternally-minded. 
It never considers the eternal fate of souls. It only looks within. It never applies the eternal truth of the Gospels. It's only concerned about the stuff around it. It is distinctly devoid of God and His influence, and it is motivated by pride and selfish ambition. Earthly wisdom can never see beyond itself or its own circumstances. We see this in the philosophy of having it my way or looking out for number one. Me first. Second, this kind of not wisdom is unspiritual. That is to say it's sensual and of the flesh. It simply cannot relate to the spiritual world. It can only relate to that which is physical, fallen, and unredeemed. Paul contrasts the spiritual man to the natural man who can't see or recognize the things of God because he himself does not know God. I, was, I once told someone, you know, Scripture has this to say about this particular situation. This is how, what I think we should do. And this person replied, this is an unbeliever, well, that's all well and good for you, pastor, but we live in the real world. By which he meant he lived in the unspiritual world. So-called wisdom that is unspiritual cannot see beyond the physical It cannot measure or take into account the spiritual nature of things, nor the things of the Spirit. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1, the things of the Spirit are foolishness to the natural man. How many, don't show your hands. Think about when you tithe. Uh, Can you imagine telling your your coworkers that are unbelievers, yeah, I give my money to the church because I I think that it's good. What do you mean? You don't keep your money? Man, put that away for retirement. Are you crazy? They don't understand it. It's foolishness. All this man's concerns are grounded in his own feelings, desires, appetites, and standards. He becomes his own source of truth, which is diametrically opposed to the real truth of God. Ultimately, we find this kind of not wisdom is demonic in its origin. That is to say, it's rooted in the work and the plan of Satan himself. After all, it was was it not Satan who told Eve, look at how beautiful the fruit is. That's sensual wisdom. You will not surely die. Don't trust God's word. Trust your own wisdom. And God doesn't want you to eat the fruit because if you do, you'll be like him. He's stoking her jealousy and selfish ambition. Ultimately, he tempted her to do what was right in her own eyes, literally choosing herself and her desires over the good of every human being who would ever live. This is Satan's work. He always promises wisdom to those this quote-unquote wisdom, to those who give themselves to him. I won't linger too long here on this issue of demons. Those of you who know me uh, know I'm not what a Christian friend of mine called a spooky Christian, right? I don't see demons behind every disappointment or Satan behind every setback. But because James has mentioned it several times already, I should point out it would be the height of uh, foolishness to ignore what he's saying about our spiritual battles. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, to put on the whole armor of God because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. He's describing spiritual warfare. And I would remind you that Satan is the father of lies. The demons are carrying out his plan. Is it any wonder James has mentioned the danger of deception so often? We are in real danger of being deceived into believing our own false sense of wisdom, which is really demonic wisdom, over and against the real true wisdom of God. And the result, he says, of believing this false wisdom and putting it into practice is disorder and every vile practice. Disorder means instability, confusion, division, and disarray. You might think of that unstable man in chapter 1. And then there's the more, the even more frightening term, every vile practice. James literally opens the door to any and every kind of evil imaginable if we are deceived into adopting a worldly, fleshly standard of wisdom instead of God's wisdom. This is worldly wisdom. But what does godly wisdom look like? What are the characteristics? James says wisdom from above is first pure. That word translated pure has the same root word as holy. It means free from contamination, set apart, or true. Notice it is the priority. He says it is first pure, then all the other things. 
That's important because James has just talked about the necessity of being meek and peaceful. And so if we're not careful, we will choose peace over and above holiness. The word, the the Lord values peace, but peace without truth is no peace at all. So James says, real wisdom is that which is built upon truth first and foremost. If we're going to be truly wise, our first priority will have to be truth. True wisdom, which we find in Scripture, means fleshing out our faith in such a way that we look different than the world, that we stand out from our neighbors. That we think and behave counter to popular society. Our lives should make little to no sense to anyone who does not know or follow Jesus. After all, they are of the flesh and we are of the spirit. Our life choices should be so strange and bizarre that the only explanation is Jesus Christ. That's pure wisdom. Notice second, he says it's peaceable. We've talked about this at length. And we talked about it at length in our message on anger. But it is to our great shame that so many Christians are known for being angry, divisive, or just plain unkind. We are to be men and women of peace. Yes, our Lord and his wisdom run counter to that of the world. Yes, that will cause division from time to time. But let Christ and his word be the cause of our division, not our own ugliness and sin. How can I know I'm being wise? One of the ways is by asking if the things I'm doing produce holiness and peace. Third, we must be gentle. We've already talked about this at length. Same idea here, we're not to be overbearing. It's not our job to own the other guy in an argument. We're not trying to win a debate. We're supposed to win him to Jesus. This goes back to what we said in chapter 1 about being quick to hear and the necessity of practicing empathy. We've got to be known as quiet, compassionate, and caring or no one is going to want to hear what we have to say about Jesus. Think about that guy at work, that lady at work, that's kind of a jerk. You don't really like her. You should be kind to her, by the way. But think about her. Think about him. And then say, do you take their word very seriously? Do you take their opinion all that seriously? So if you act like a jerk, why would anyone listen to what you have to say about Jesus? Fourth, we must be reasonable or open to reason. That is, it means willing to yield, assuming that doing so doesn't compromise our purity or the truth of God's word. Another translation of this word is teachable and willing to listen. So it's closely related to gentle. I really can't say this enough, but this is what it means to imitate Christ. Yes, he got angry and he turned over the money changers temple, uh, tables in the temple. He did it twice, in fact. Yes, he stood up for the principle of purity and the truths of God. And there's going to be a time for us to do that every now and again. But the overall picture of Jesus in the Gospels is of a gentle, kind, reasonable person who loved the people around him, who wept over their brokenness and sin, and who gave himself, not only in his day-to-day life, but ultimately on a cross for our sake. He was full of mercy. That's number five. Christ was willing to help. He cared for the poor. Think of all the times he healed people. We might think once again of the Good Samaritan, the story he told. The Good Samaritan who recognized how desperately he would need mercy had he been in the same situation as the man who'd been beaten on the side of the road. And so what does he do? He gives himself in order to help. He sacrificed his own way for the sake of others. If you want to know if you're wise, how often are you exhibiting mercy? You're wondering, how much do I exhibit mercy? Notice it says full of mercy, abundant mercy. Number six, how often are you exhibiting the good fruit of the Spirit? They're a necessary sign that your heart's been changed by God. Number seven, that we would be impartial. At this point, James is just working through the things he's already warned us about in chapter one, right? Is there any partiality or prejudice in your heart? That's a sign of sin and that you're a fool, according to James. This idea of partiality carries with it the idea of undividedness. Not like that double-minded foolish man. Your loyalties aren't divided between Christ and any other thing. Finally, true wisdom from above is sincere. That is, without hypocrisy. This has to do with the, having the same standard across the board for yourself and for others. It has to do with what he said at the beginning. 
what he's been saying throughout the letter, namely that we believe, that what we believe is then fleshed out in how we behave. Are you wise? Show it by your good deeds. Now, all this leads us thirdly and very quickly to a concept to confess. Look at verse 18. And harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. James brings this chapter to a close by drawing our attention to the concept of sowing and reaping. This entire passage is about testing our wisdom to see if it's godly. He told us that true godly wisdom produces righteous results. And so the concept he wants us to understand is that if we sow righteousness and peace, which are the results of having lived wisely, then we'll reap righteousness and peace. Jesus, uh, uh, James said we'd reap what we sow, and so did Jesus. How can I know if I'm wise? Ask yourself, what are the results of the choices I make? Do my choices produce purity and peace, or do they produce jealousy and selfishness? Do my choices produce gentleness and reasonableness, or do they produce disorder and evil? If I sow mercy, I'll reap mercy. If I sow peace, I'll reap peace. And if I'm not reaping those things, there's a very good chance that what I think is wisdom, what I claim to be wisdom, isn't really wisdom at all. Now, this isn't a promise you'll never experience trouble or pain. James literally started this book by saying we will encounter various trials. It's not a promise that we'll never be persecuted or misunderstood in this world. In fact, he's writing to a church in exile. This isn't the prosperity gospel, but what James is saying is that there's a direct line between living wisely and being at peace with God. There's a direct line between the wisdom we embrace and the fruit of that wisdom in our day-to-day lives. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Church, I want you to ask yourself today, am I wise? If so, your life will produce righteous fruit. Do you have understanding? Then you'll obediently serve Christ and your neighbor, and this is wisdom. I ask with James, are you wise? Lord, we thank you for this day. And... uh, We do ask you this morning to search our hearts. Tell us, Lord, if we're wise. Lord, show us the fruit of our living so that we'll know. God, would you make us wise? We beg you for wisdom today. We'd so desperately need it. We want to stand out from this world because we want to be a first fruits offering for you. We want the opportunity to tell our neighbors all the amazing things that you've done for us. We want the opportunity to tell them how they can be saved, to share the gospel, to invite them into this fellowship, this covenant that is good and righteous and holy and eternal. But Lord, we recognize that in order to do that, we are going to need you to empower our righteous living to make us wise. So Lord, we ask you today, reveal in our hearts those places that don't match you, the so-called wisdom that isn't real wisdom, godly wisdom, and then change us and make us obedient to your heart. Lord, if there's anyone here today who's heard the gospel for the first time, maybe they came in thinking that there were boxes that needed to be checked in order to know you. They came in thinking they had to earn their salvation. Maybe they just came in not believing in you at all, but they've heard about your great love and grace, your desire to draw them to you and spend eternity with you. God, I pray that you would do a work in their hearts and save them today. We love you and thank you in your precious name. Amen. Thank you guys for being here. We love you. Have a great day. We'll see you next week.